Welcome to Cognition and Perception. My name is Rick or Ricky. I am less into formalities in general, but Professor Max, Doctor, you can call me however you feel like. So in this video, I want to tell you a little bit about the course. We'll go through the syllabus. Then uh, the TAs will present themselves. I'll present myself. And in the end, I will tell you a little bit about the general overview of the content that we'll go through. So this semester, I'm teaching both cognition and perception, which are strongly interconnected courses. They derive from the same big questions and they endure the same kind of challenges. We'll talk a lot about it. So in the beginning, both courses will go more or less together and after the first weeks they'll start to diverge into different topics. But uh, And sometimes I'll talk about cognition in perception and the opposite and maybe we'll invite you to watch interesting things from the other course. But whenever I say this course, I refer to your course, to whichever course you are enrolled in. Now, uh, this course is perhaps one of the most important undergraduate course in psychology. And that's because, first of all, most of you, this will be your first encounter with the big tools, the main tools of science making, which is critical thinking and communication, be that reading, writing and presenting ideas. The second reason is because cognition and perception directly derive from the biggest, the oldest, the most annoying and the most intriguing questions that we humans have been asking since the day that we decided that we don't feel like being monkeys anymore. And since then, we are in the same rabbit hole asking again and again what is going on? What are we doing here? Um, who am I? What am I? What am I for? What is the meaning of life? These are all the same questions in different versions. What is reality? What is truth? What is universal truth? How can we know that we really know what we think that we know? we will talk about the connection of mind and body. We, since we know ourselves since the age of three or something, we have this very strong feeling of what is me and what is not me. We perceive our abstract self as a unitary and coherent thing. One, my, my thoughts, my feelings, my emotions, my memories, my identity, they are all one. We feel a straight line throughout the ears. We will see that that is not so, or we don't have as much control and access to our memories, most of all, even though we feel that we are one thing. At the same time, we also feel that our body is one me. And it's very clear what is not my body. We will ask how can we address the question of the connection between mind, mind and body. Now, all those questions derive from our never-ending, insatiable need to understand human experience in this world. Why we are so worried about it, I don't know. Looking from outside, we live and die doing exactly the same things like all other monkeys. We eat, sleep and try to have sex. But it is what it is. We are really bothered by those questions. Now, our experience in this world is a function of our interaction within it. 
meaning how we collect information and process this information. So roughly speaking, the field of perception deals with the collection of the information with our senses and cognition with our processing of that information. Obviously, this is a very artificial separation. It's one long process of collecting and processing the information. Um, during our lectures, we will firstly cover the definition of those big questions, mainly from the world of philosophy. And then gradually we'll plunge into the scientific literature and the proposals of how to understand the inner mechanisms of this long process. Now this course, this semester, will be taught a little bit different than it has been taught in previous semesters. And uh, later you, under you understand exactly how. But one point I want to stress now. As much as you'll be bestowed with hours and hours of me talking about hopefully interesting things, the main value for you will be in the recitations. And that's why we have a specially strong lineup of TAs. Their CVs are very annoying. They are full of magna cum laude, summa cum laude, magna carta, tabula rasa, alpha, beta, gamma, sigma, kappa, all those things. Uh, I try to find, you know, uh, hobbies, favorite colors, nothing. They, uh, all they have is like a beefy section of honors and awards. So those are your TAs. They don't see colors and in their leisure time they collect awards. Now let me tell you what we would like to offer you in this course. What we hope you will gain from this course. So first of all, obviously, all of you want to finish it with uh, good grades. For some of you, it's more important, less important. In my humble opinion, you are already undergrads in psychology at NYU. From now on, whether you have an A plus or a B, it will matter less and less for your future. But that's a personal choice. So grade wise, to put it, to put it bluntly, this is not a difficult course, but it's an intensive one because the, mo the, the most important thing here will not be the information you will collect during the course, but the process you will go through. I'll explain in a minute. Now, from experience, I know for a fact that all students are genuinely interested and motivated to learn, to, I don't know, all those cliches, uh, open horizons. The main factors that hamper student engagement are either when the teacher fails to make it interesting and relevant for you, and that's on me. And for that, we will ask for your help. We will ask for feedback all the time. Later, I'll talk exactly how. Uh, and the second thing is uh, personal reasons. Sometimes it's, uh, it's the wrong timing, a bad semester, have problems at home, uh, you are overloaded. Talk to us. We will try to help you as much as possible. Why did I say that the textbook information is the less important part? Because, first of all, you guys are provenly smart, intelligent and hardworking. You don't need us to read the book. The book is comprehensive, very well written and clear. Second of all, as you already know, this information will dissipate with time. 
After one year, all you have are glimpses for of some part of or another that for some reason touched you more or less. What will remain are the tools that you learn during the process. Forgive me for the cliché, but it's not about the fishes we caught together, it's about you learning how to fish. So it's a process, which means that it's gradual and it's interactive and you have to be active in questioning yourself, questioning the way you understand the word, debating yourself, de debating us, interacting with us. It's training, like learning an instrument or any sports. Specifically, what we are talking about is critical thinking and communication skills. Now, why scientists, experienced scientists, irrespective of their ex, uh, field of expertise, they are sought after by business consult uh, consulting firms, think tanks, uh, advisory boards of anything, everything concerning problem solving, decision making, policy making. It's because they are trained into First of all, dissecting the gist of a problem, which means asking the most critical questions behind what seems to be the problem. They are trained to recognize what are the sine qua non questions, meaning the absolute necessary questions to be asked in order to achieve whatever you're trying to achieve. And usually, mostly, or perhaps always, everything we are trying to achieve in life, directly or indirectly, involves affecting other people, convincing other people, uh, even an artist. By the end of the day, he, the, the artist is trying to affect other people, which can only be achieved by convincing them that whatever the artist is doing is relevant. So the first thing about a scientist is the ability to recognize the gist of the problem. And the second thing is that scientists are trained into communicating ideas. To summarize it bombastically, we are going to try to understand how humans have been trying to explain how the human mind works, not by accepting or rejecting specific answers, but by focusing on the motivating question behind those answers. And to finish it even more bombastically, our motto will be the omnibus dubitandum est, which means everything must be doubted. And that is the title of a book by Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Danish philosopher from the 19th century. Okay, let's talk about the syllabus. Uh, first of all, please read it. It's a fantastic reading. So, my lectures will be recorded not live and uploaded every week to NYU classes. And I will give you also the entire lecture so you can watch it in one swish. And I will also add uh, the parts of the lectures according to topics. So if you want to go back and watch only a specific uh, topic, you won't have to look for the, for the part inside the one hour lecture. I'll also give you a map of what is where, which minute, etc. Um, now, 
my lecture hours will serve mostly for office hours, not every week, but everything you will be notified all the time. Whatever changes and whatever, whatever we add and every time there is a new lecture uploaded, you will be notified. Um, so my uh, so the lecture hours will be mostly office hours where I'll be open online on Zoom and you can enter and talk to me uh, about anything. If you agree and the content is relevant for your colleagues, then we can make it open for everybody or you can talk to me privately about anything. Um, sometimes we will have uh, reviews during my lecture, live reviews during my lecture hours, and sometimes uh, we'll have uh, maybe guest speakers or your TAs will present part some specific topic or their research. But again, everything will notify you up front and everything will be recorded and uploaded. So you can watch whenever you want. Now, uh, the recitations will be conducted live and recorded and uploaded to their respective sections in NYU classes. So NYU classes, you will have, each student will have two different sites. One, the main site of the course, where my lectures will be, and the other one only for your recitation section. So the recitations will be uploaded to the respective section NYU classes. Um, for all the asynchronous students far away in unviable time zones, don't worry, we will schedule, we can have uh, uh, office hours by appointment and recitations. You will not be lost. We'll find solutions for everybody, don't worry. Um, as you probably already realize, there will be no exams. And because of obvious reasons, the time zones and all the uh, remote mess, there is no requirement for attendance in anything, neither uh, either lectures or recitations. Let's talk about COVID. Okay, so first of all, I know you are more than tired to hear about it. And you probably saw me twice a week on the television saying the same thing again and again, but it's important and I must say it here again. I'll say it shortly. I am sorry. I apologize. I admit I shouldn't have eaten those bats, but I cannot and eat them. We are still learning from semester to semester. We are changing things and uh, we will maybe have changes in our dynamics during the semester. Now, two things I want to say about it. First of all, I promise that whatever we do, whatever we change, it will be to facilitate students. We will not add stuff. We will not complicate things more than they are already complicated. Second thing, in order to calibrate and accommodate things during the semester, we will need your feedback all the time. And we'll talk about it. How? <clears throat> now, one thing that I like about COVID, no, let me rephrase it. Um, one silver lining about remote teaching, fully remote teaching, is that I will always be able to add stuff. Um, we will be in touch. If there are things that are not clear, you want to hear more about it, I can, also, I can always add more 
Oceans of Wisdom of video to NYU classes. The second thing is that I can always tell myself that my jokes are working. Now, everything I'm telling you will be repeated again and again and will be explained and re-explained in the recitations and you can ask us anytime, anything. All right, let's talk about grading. So your grading will be mainly two kind of assignments, the Qaddafi assignments and the EDM assignments and the weekly feedbacks and the initial survey. Uh, but the weekly feedbacks and the initial surveys, they are not assignments. They are very, it's one minute to, it's nothing. So the Qaddafi assignments is like this. Every week you will be given, beginning from the second week, you'll be given a paper to read and on which you apply the Qaddafi method, I'll explain in a minute. And uh, during the recitations every week, uh, your TA will go through that paper and that Qaddafi. You will be asked, required, to submit seven Qaddafi assignments to be graded. You can submit every week, uh, but uh, you will choose which seven you want them to be graded. You choose when you, when you submit. Um, and you also be able to submit two additional Qaddafi assignments, uh, optional, and then you have nine from which you drop the two lowest scores. All right, great. Um, the Qaddafi assignment uh, is a very simple method. Uh, that will help you to find the most important message in a written material in general, in a specific, specifically here, in a uh, scientific paper. Now, um, it will be explained and re-explained. We will upload a uh, 20 minutes video by Caroline explaining the Qaddafi method. And we also have a well-written uh, paper by Pascal in the, in the course's uh, resources and also a small one. So don't worry, it's very simple and it's very useful most of all. Uh, the EDM assignment is like this. Beginning from the uh, fourth week, you will be divided in groups uh, in your recitation. And for those asynchronous, you will, be you will be divided into groups in your time zone. And if you are the only one in your... We'll find solutions for, for everyone, don't worry. But you will be divided into groups. You work together with your group until the end of the semester. And during, uh, during which you will propose a small experimental project. You think about the main theoretical question and then you learn how to translate it into operational variables and you choose the method. Uh, and then we will not run the experiment, but we, the TA will help you to um, imagine the hypothetical result, uh, results uh, and then you will describe the uh, conclusions from your study. So half of this, of this project, you write it, um, you submit it by the end of the semester with your group, though you will be graded individually. The TA will explain exactly how during the first uh, 
the first uh, recitations. And the second part, you will present your project, your EDM project. Uh, present by video. Your TA will choose, will divide your project according to parts and will choose who will present what. Again, everything will be thoroughly explained. Um, then we have the weekly feedbacks. Let me explain the weekly feedbacks. So every week we'll ask you, you'll be asked to, we have 14 weeks, we'll ask you to submit uh, 10 submissions, uh, each one one point, it's a requirement, and then you also be able to submit two additional for extra points, a half a point each. So it's a simple questionnaire about what, uh, what are your impressions from the content of the course? What is really interesting? What would you like to hear more? What is not clear? What you don't like? This kind of stuff. It's really simple and it's really short but we need this feedback from you. It's not to force you to watch the lectures. This is... We are not here to educate you. This is for us to understand if the way we are teaching is working. Um, and then we have the initial survey, which is a simple questionnaire that you will fill during the first three weeks of the semester. A word about the research participation program, the SONA program. So all over the world, for decades, a, a huge chunk of research in psychology relies on undergrad students as uh, participants, as subjects. Now, you guys are highly motivated and you have prime quality brain. And especially in cognition and perception, uh, the homogeneity of the participants is an advantage rather than a concern. Now, for you, it's a great opportunity to experience firsthand how a real experiment runs. Uh, and you understand... Uh, the, the vibes and the kind of tasks that, uh, upon which all the research is based. Now, the department at NYU requires cognition students to participate in two hours uh, in the semester. It's explained in the syllabus and in the, uh, I'll say in a word, the, uh, the PDF. Uh, Perception students are not required, but we highly recommend to participate for the reasons I just explained. So we will give an extra 1% point to the final grade for perception students that participate in one hour and for cognition students that participate in an additional hour, and a third hour beyond the two required hours. Now, four points I want to say about this. Most tasks are not demanding, they are not difficult, and they usually last less than one hour. Secondly, they are completely anonymous by law. Third, there is no deceit or there are no tricks also by law. Um, and fourth, um, after you, comp you finish the task, you are entitled to hear about the research, about the, the experiment and the research uh, in general. So, depends who will run the experiment. It may be a research assistant or uh, a master's or a PhD student. Um, ask, ask them, and if it interests you, you can ask for the, uh, for the main researcher behind the, uh, the experiment, be that a postdoc, a, 
uh, a PhD student, a master student or a PI, most of the time they will be more than glad to explain to you if you're interested, so do it. Um, you will find all the details about this program and how to engage in it inside our NYU classes uh, main site, inside resources, there is a PDF called Advanced Psych Student Guide Revised 1720. Uh, Go for it. I apologize for repeating myself again and again, but we do need and want your feedback all the time. So beyond the weekly feedback uh, submission that we will require you to, uh, to submit, we are offering, more than offering, we want you to use our anonymous feedback platform because the weekly submission is nominal. And obviously, there will be things that you will feel uncomfortable to tell us with your name under it. It makes sense. Uh, so please use it. We want to hear and use it indiscriminately. Say everything in your heart. It's good for you. It's good for us. And it's anonymous. So by now, I imagine that you're starting to suspect that we want to be in touch and be as accessible as we can. All right. So you can address any one of us anytime about anything. But to make things more organized, simpler and faster, we would like you to try to address specific people depending on the content. Uh, of your question. So everything regarding grading, attendance, technical stuff, please talk to your TA. Things regarding the Gaddafi assignments, turn to Chelsea. Everything regarding the EDM assignments, talk to May. And uh, everything regarding content, uh, please send it to me and your TA in the same email. Um, so, all in all, we have 300 students, so we will do our best to address, to answer everything as fast as possible, but it will be challenging. So, all I ask is patience and don't hesitate for a moment to insist. You're not bothering anyone. Uh, it's, uh, it's we that apologize if you find yourself reminding us of something that you already asked. But please do, help us. Uh, that's it. So now may, I, uh, may, uh, may we present ourselves. Let's start. With, by the way, I, uh, before I had a dubiously funny joke about your TAs collecting awards in their leisure time. Well, they have the awards, but it's not in their leisure time. Uh, they are not like that. But you know them personally, so I'm not, I don't have to explain. Hi, everyone. My name is May, and I'm one of your TAs for Cognition this semester. Just want to share a little bit about myself so you guys can get to know me. I was born in China but I live back and forth in China and Japan until I moved to the United States. So I am kind of multilingual. Um, I've been living in New York for 10 years. I love swimming, I love baking. I've been playing the flute for 12 years and the guitar for seven years. So I kind of like, like anything that relates to music as well. One fun fact about me is that I am actually, unfortunately, allergic to 31 different things, ranging from foods to animals to the environment. Um, but I managed to survive. Previously, I've done projects on second language acquisition um, and stereotype threat, but my research interests right now mainly focus on topics in social cognition, such as decision-making, motivation, um, and information processing in social contexts. In this semester, I'll be working with a postdoc on projects relating to those areas. And if you guys have any questions concerning those domains or anything about the course, do not hesitate to reach out to me and know that I am a resource here available to you. And I look forward to meeting you online. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea Berg. You can just call me Chelsea. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And here's a little bit about me. I got married uh, back in October during the pandemic, hence the masked affair and photo you can see in the top corner. I grew up on a farm in New Jersey with three sisters. I graduated from Rutgers University in 2015 with majors in psychology and minors in biology and cognitive science. Currently, I have two pets. One is a dog named Ruby and the other is a cat named Coco. Some of my hobbies include gardening, baking, candle making, and drinking coffee. But as far as what I've done for my research, as Lincoln Park said, uh, I've really focused on memory and more specifically things like risk factors for cognitive decline or cognitive impairment in clinical populations. So that has an included things like genetic risk factors or brain-based biomarkers, and also interestingly, community-based approaches to Alzheimer's prevention. Currently, my master's thesis here at NYU looks at the combined effects of epilepsy biomarkers, anti-seizure medications, and depression on memory function. So if you have any questions about things like memory or how to be an undergraduate student in a virtual environment or cognition, of course, feel free to reach out to me at any time over email. And I'm really excited to work with you all this semester and talk to you soon. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline and I'm the head TA for both the cognition and perception courses this semester. I use she, her pronouns and you can pronounce my name like Caroline. Just to give you guys a little bit of background about me and my interests, um, as you can see here, I'm a huge animal person. I have this lovely little cat. Her name is Kiro, and she is 26 pounds of just straight rescue love. Um, I also have two horses, and I have this cute little bunny rabbit named Cookie. Um, I'm also very, very into music and the arts. During the pandemic, I actually taught myself how to play ukulele, so I guess now I can tangentially call myself a musician. Um, when we're not in quarantine and not in lockdown, I also really love traveling. And a lot of the times you can find me in Berlin, in Berlin, Germany. Um, and to tell you guys a little bit about my research and my research interests. So I'm in the Carrasco lab here at NYU, which is run by Marisa Carrasco. But I've also been fortunate enough to work in a variety of other labs here as an undergraduate. Um, I worked in Pascal Wallace's Fox lab and a couple of the other social and social neuroscience uh, labs here on campus. So if you have questions about getting involved in research as an undergrad, I'm more than happy to chat with you about that. Um, Currently, my research deals with visual attention and perception and how visual attention improves performance at different locations around the visual field. Um, and I study this using a combination of behavioral psychophysics, which we'll talk a lot about, and looking at oculomotor behavior or eye movements, right? So these are things that we're going to discuss a lot in depth in both of these courses, um, but I'm really, really excited to get to know all of you and get to meet all of you. And I'm excited to have, have a great semester with you all. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, because this is one of the rare opportunities when uh, someone has to listen to me talking about myself without me having to pay for it. Uh, second of all, because naturally I will talk about my experiences uh, as examples of things we will talk about. So I would like to give you some context. Um, my family is originally from Europe, mainly Germany, Austria, and other stuff. And uh, then there was the Holocaust and there was a mess. My parents, as children, somehow arrived to Brazil. My mother grew up in a kindergarten, in an orphanage. And um, my parents met there. I was born in Brazil, that's why my name. And when I was 17, I left Brazil alone. My parents still live in Brazil. I, I was in Boston for a while, and then I moved to Israel. I was uh, born with Israeli citizenship. Uh, right after I arrived, I was drafted to the army. Now, I want to say something that is delicate, and uh, I know it's uncomfortable for you to hear, but I must say, because otherwise, from experience, students always find out and they talk and they reach their own conclusions. So I must say, um, I was in the Israeli army for many years. I was in a combat unit. 
Um, I was three years in a row and then I continued for seven additional years uh, as an active reserve, um, which was intensive. Every year, one month, one month and a half in a serious active duty. Uh, I was supposed to continue until the age of 42, but uh, after seven years I refused to continue because I am strongly opposed to the policies of the governments of Israel regarding the Palestinians. Um, in the beginning I was a unthinking young 18 years old boy, not that every 18 years old uh, young man doesn't think, but I didn't. Um, and then when the, I started to understand, in the beginning I thought that better me doing the right thing from within than refusing until it became unbearable. Now, let me stress that I'm not against Israel, I'm not against Israelis, I am one, and half of the Israelis think like me. But, uh, and different people reach different conclusions, different people have different experiences and see different pictures. This is my personal conclusion from my personal experiences. This is the only picture I have. I accept people that think the opposite from what I think. Um, but I think what I think based on what I saw and did. Uh, I'm not trying to defend myself, I'm just describing what was. That's it. Um, after the army, I joined Tel Aviv University in 1997 and I stayed there until 2015, that's 18 years. In the middle, I did have, uh, I, for five years, I worked as a film producer. I had a small production company with two partners. And after five years, I went back to the university. So uh, all in all, I, uh, in those days, Tel Aviv University was very, the tuition was symbolic almost. I don't know if it's still like that. And also I had an army scholarship. So I, so the tuition was not an issue. So I allowed myself to go through everything I wanted. Uh, all in all, between BAs, MAs and PhD, I went through 12 different departments. The most meaningful ones were uh, psychology, neuroscience, history, philosophy and cinema. Cinema, I did, uh, I finished a master's in film direction. That's why I worked as a film producer. Uh, in 2015, I arrived to New York and um, I'm here. I've been working other stuff that I did. I was still am a little bit into machine learning and artificial intelligence intelligence. I worked uh, a little bit in high tech. I also uh, I am a carpenter. It was in the first years that uh, after I left the army in my first years in the university, I had two jobs. One was uh, woodworking, a furniture maker. I still am. I have a small shop here in Brooklyn. I still do furniture. Maybe one day I'll show you my little shop. And the other job I had was, uh, uh, I was um, for years, I was a nightclub bouncer in Tel Aviv. Uh, yes, I was beaten many times. I had my uh, ribs broken. I had my nose broken. Maybe you can see. My nose was broken, I think, twice. And, um, well, I also broke some noses. But I was beaten many times, yes. 
The last thing I want to say about me or to warn you about me is like this. I have a big, impulsive, unhinged mouth. I say things. I don't think, and when I hear, when after I said, I hear what I said together with you. And sometimes I am horrified just like you. Now, I am improving, but sometimes I say things. Uh, first of all, because I come from a culture, you know, in Israel, how can I say, tactfulness is, is not a thing. Uh, and, and on top of that, I also have this dry sarcasm. And sometimes I say a joke and I forget to give any hint that I am trying to be funny. Not a smile, not... not so, so people that don't know me sometimes don't understand that I'm being sarcastic. And so... I want you to know that whenever you hear me saying something absolutely strange or inappropriate or out of context, so I was trying to be funny, that's all. And lastly, please, if I say something that offends you, or that it's uncomfort uncomfortable for you to hear, please let me know. You can let me know anonymously or directly. You can give me a call. You can uh, um, a voice message to my seller. How, please tell me. First of all, so I can apologize. And second, so I can not do it again. I'm serious. Please let me know if I cross any line. That's it. All right, so we are done for today. In my next lectures, in my next few lectures, we'll talk about a lot of, inter hopefully, interesting stuff. We'll talk about the meaning of life, we'll talk about evolution, we'll talk about the Bible, we'll talk about philosophers. The good news is that there will be nothing for you to memorize. You won't be tested on that. It's just for you to have the big picture the big context of how we humans arrived to the scientific literature that we'll cover during the rest of the semester. Uh, so relax and flow with me. And next week we'll start with the recitations. See you soon.